So before I be uh, before we begin, can I just, as always, remind members in relation and our guests in relation to turning off your mobile phones as it can affect transmission uh, of our proceedings. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome today uh, the Deputy Director General, Dr. Carlos Martinez Mungay, uh, to our committee, and to welcome you back uh, to our committee uh, as you've been here before. Uh, and accompanied, he is accompanied today by. Uh, Maria Jose de Val Tedden, Stefan Kernert, Jerry Kiley, uh, Patrick O'Reardon, and William no New. So, thank you very much all for uh, being here today. Um, the purpose of today's meeting is obviously uh, to discuss with the Commission uh, the Country Report of Ireland 2019, which was recently published as part of the European semester. Uh, this is an annual process and ensures that Member States comply with the EU economic policy recommendations before national budgets are adopted. Uh, obviously, our committee fits into its work in ensuring that as well. So we're interested in learning more about the EU semester, the Commission's views on the, your country-specific recommendations, and obviously on our economy in general. Um, it's a good opportunity to have that exchange of views. Um, and uh, so before I get into that exchange of views and ask you to make your opening statement, just a small piece of housekeeping that we have to do here always, which is just to draw your attention to the position on privilege. So I wish to advise you that by virtue of Section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence they give to the committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence on a particular matter and continue to do so, you're entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that when and where possible you should not criticise or make charges against any person or entity by name in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Members are also reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So having gone through that statement, I am now in a position to ask you if you could uh, to make, uh, invite you to make your opening statement to us and our thanks again for your attendance here today. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Uh, of course, it is a, a great pleasure to be, to be here today to exchange views on the country report uh, for Ireland. Uh, I must say that this is the third time I, uh, you have given me the opportunity to address uh, this committee. Last year, you invited me to present the country-specific recommendations, which were adopted uh, <coughs> by the Council. Uh, the country report for Ireland was published by the Commission on the 27th of February, together with the country reports of the other member states. And on the same day, the Commission also adopted a communication summarizing the main findings in the 20 reports. Let me recall very briefly that the country reports are midway in the cycle of the European semester. As you know, the European semester is the process within which member states coordinate their economic uh, policies. The current uh, cycle started on the 21st of November last year with the adoption of the commission, by the Commission of the Annual Growth Survey the alert mechanism report, the draft joint employment report, and the recommendations for the euro area. For your convenience, we have distributed a few slides, which appear in the, in the screen, which support this, this presentation. So the European semester cycle is showed in this uh, first uh, figure. I, don't, I would not propose to go through the, through, the, through the slide, through the figure, as I did last year, but of course we can come uh, during the question and answer session uh, whenever you want. Uh, uh, now, I mean, I think that today we can say that we open the dialogue phase with the authorities and the stakeholders in order to prepare the country-specific recommendations of this year. My presence here today is part of this uh, dialogue uh, phase. Uh, before summarizing the findings of the country report, 
Let me highlight a distinctive feature of the current European semester cycle. The current European semester cycle runs in parallel this time with the negotiations of the multiannual financial framework for the period 21-27. As you know, this is the moment when the EU establishes the public investment priorities for the coming 10 years. This is the reason why the Commission considers this an opportunity to reinforce the synergies between economic policy coordination within the European semester and the allocation of EU funds. This year, the European semester is putting a particularly strong focus on identifying and prioritizing national and regional investment needs to guide the programming of the cohesion policy projects. In practical terms, this means that all country reports have included a specific annex on investment areas that the Commission considers a priority for the European Regional Development Fund and the European Social Fund Plus over the period 21-27. This annex will serve as a basis for the dialogue between Member States and the Commission in view of programming these funds. In this regard, I'm happy to announce that my colleagues responsible for regional and social funds are coming to Dublin on 20th March to present this Annex D to the Irish authorities. Uh, and stakeholders, of course. But the analysis of investment needs is not just confined to this annex. The Commission has identified as well the priority areas for public and private investment in each country. Which, and these priority areas are the ones that underpin inclusive and sustainable economic growth and intense job crea creation. Let me finish this introduction by confirming that this is not the only event to discuss the findings of the country reports with the authorities and the social and economic stakeholders. I, myself, will have the pleasure to meet many stakeholders tomorrow when a commission team will present the findings of the country report in the European Commission representation here in Dublin. Let me now turn to the main findings of the report for Ireland. As with past editions, the report provides an analysis of the economic and social situation in the country. If, uh, I mean, to start with the, with the macroeconomic framework, I would like to emphasize that the current economic policy coordination cycle takes place in a context of sustained but less dynamic economic growth in Europe. Although the European economy is expected to grow for the seventh year in a row, the pace of growth is projected to moderate and the outlook is subject to large uncertainty. Ireland, of course, is not an exception. Economic growth in Ireland was robust in 2018, supported by a strong labor market developments and construction investment. However, real GDP growth is forecast to moderate in 2019, this year, and next year. Although compared, compared with many other member states, it will remain solid. Uh, I, in, in, the, in figure number two, so in the previous one, you have there the profile and the composition of growth, uh, including in our forecast. This benign outlook is clouded by heightened uncertainty, mostly related to external factors, such as the terms of the UK's uh, withdrawal from the European Union and changes in the international trans taxation and trade environment. Since I have mentioned Brexit, let me say that the publication of the country reports occurred this year, just 30 days ahead of the deadline for the UK withdrawal from the EU. Despite 
the closeness of this deadline, the terms of the UK's future relations with the EU were uncertain at that time, at the moment of preparing and publishing the report. This, again, led us to avoid the speculations in the report about possible scenarios, and instead we use a technical assumption of status quo in terms of trading relationships between the, EU, the EU and the UK. Of course, the vote uh, yesterday at the British Parliament has not uh, clarified much the situation. I understand that there is a vote the, today and probably a vote tomorrow. So we are uh, still in this uh, uncertain environment. Of course, uh, I would like to say that the, that the Commission regrets very much the, uh, the, the, the outcome of the vote yesterday. And uh, to some extent, uh, we are disappointed that the UK government has been unable to ensure a majority for the withdrawal agreement agreed by both parties in November. Uh, moving again to the, to the content of the, of the report, uh, concerning labour markets, uh, the outcomes remain favourable with the unemployment rate approaching pre-crisis levels. However, as the labour market tightens, skill shortages are becoming increasingly apparent in the, uh, the fast-growing sectors, most notably for information and communication technology, construction and professionals, high-skilled professionals within the sector of construction, construction and property. Against this background, wage growth is picking up. This could be a sign of an economy operating at its potential. And this is the reason why we have indicated that the Irish economy could show some signs of overheating. In this context, I would like also to, 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 to mention the fact that um, at the same time we observe a relatively low rate of labour market participation, notably by women, and uh, an involuntary part-time work, which show or could show the existence of underused human capacity. Moving to a more detailed summary of the main, of the main findings, I would like to recall that within uh, the, the the macroeconomic imbalances procedure, Ireland was identified last year as recording macroeconomic imbalances, although they were not considered as excessive. As has been the case of the other member states where the possible existence of risks of macroeconomic imbalances were identified in the Aller Mechanism report back in November, the report for Ireland undertakes an in-depth review of possible macroeconomic imbalances. This is exactly the figure I wanted to, to show you in which you can find a summary of the decisions and the different allocation of the member states in the, in the uh, both, in the macroeconomic imbalance procedure and in the stability and growth pact. The report finds that Ireland continues to face macroeconomic imbalances related to the large stock of private and public debt and net external liabilities. Challenges remain despite notable improvements on the back of robust economic growth and policy action. In particular, public debt relative to GDP is diminishing but remains vulnerable to unfavorable shocks. In addition, as also highlighted by this committee in the recent post-budget report, the reliance on potentially volatile revenues and recurrent overspending in healthcare put the long-term sustainability of public finances at risk. In a context of a strong cyclical position, better than expected tax revenue intakes provide an opportunity for accelerating debt reduction and building up buffers against adverse future shocks. 
Private indebtedness is uh, further reducing, with the private debt to GDP uh, ratio being below the macroeconomic imbalance uh, procedure threshold, once we discount the effects of multinational corporations. However, house household debt relative to gross disposable income continues to be among the highest in the European Union. This makes Irish households vulnerable to negative income shocks. The figure number four, so the next one, provides information on private indebtedness, its evolution and composition. Vulnerabilities in the financial sector are declining. Domestic banks uh, have reduced non-performing loans significantly, and this redux reduction has taken place through portfolio sales and restructuring activities. Banks have also remained profitable and well capitalized. Although these findings are positive, the report also concludes that long-term arrears continue to be relatively high. More than half of the total non-performing loans have been in arrears for more than two years and relate to mortgages. The net international investment position of the country, although highly negative, continues to improve. To what extent this points to a, to a vulnerability is difficult to determine. The investment position of the country is strongly influenced by the presence of multinational companies and the International Financial Services Center. In such a case, the possible vulnerabilities would not strongly affect the domestic sector. In the area of housing, we observe that the broad range of measures implemented by the government to tackle the undersupply of housing are bearing fruit. Housing supply is rapidly recovering, although it is true that from low levels and is still falling short of demand. As a result, house price inflation, inflation remains high, although it has recently moderated. Where investment is concerned, I have already said that uh, this year investment has a prominent, a prominent role in the, in the reports. Let me summarize that the main investment priorities in, in the report relate to research and development, skills and digitalization, uh, which and skill and digitalization, which would address the lagging productivity of domestic uh, firms. It could also address the sizable regional differences in competitiveness, productivity and skilled labor that exist in Ireland, mostly due to the concentration of multinationals around Dublin. In addition, more investment in clean energy, transport, water, broadband and housing, as well as to the carbonized sectors with high emissions could foster sustainable growth. Decarbonization is important, not only for its environmental benefits, but also because a lack of action could involve cost by 2030. In general, but also in the context of Brexit, the report considers that Ireland could benefit from diversifying its maritime transport and energy connections with continental Europe. Last but not least, access to employment for all job seekers could foster inclusive growth. Here, the lack of sufficient affordable childcare is weighing on women's labor market participation. In addition, rising homelessness uh, requires continued attention. It's worth emphasizing that the National Development Plan addresses many of these investment needs by increasing the capital investment effort to 116 billion euros over the period 2018-2027. 
Moreover, the announced future jobs program may help increase the productivity of small, of small and medium-sized enterprises. Yet, incentivizing private investment in areas such as clean energy, transport, housing and skills remains a challenge. The report also includes the customary assessment of the progress on implementing the country-specific recommendations. The conclusion is that some progress has been made. To sum up, the economic, uh, I would say that the economic outlook for Ireland remains positive, but it is clouded by heightened external risks, that the implemented structural reforms oriented towards enhancing the resilience of the Irish financial system and the rainy day fund may provide a buffer to future external shocks. However, the strong de dependence on the activities of a limited number of multinational firms, the efficiency of healthcare expenditure and closing remaining investment gaps remain challenges. Finally, let me recall that the publication of the country reports marks the start of the dialogue between the Commission and the Member States on policy options to address the identified challenges. I am therefore very interested to hear your views on our new report from Ireland, and of course, I, I remain ready to answer any question you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very interesting opening statement. I have a number of deputies who have indicated to me that they wish to come in um, and ask some questions. Um, I'm going to operate our type of usual situation of about five minutes and, um, and then we'll go around again if there's additional. So the first deputy indicating is Deputy Lahart. Thank you, Director. Uh, general and your team, and thank you for speaking to us in your second language, or at least second language, we appreciate it. A um, number of questions. Um, do you have any view in relation to future interest rate rises from the ECB? And clearly, uh, we've read something recently in relation to the, the um, susceptibility of mortgage holders here, particularly early mortgage holders who are on tracker rates, etc., to increases in ECB rates. So maybe give us a view on a timeline for that. Um, a figure that you may not be able to give us now, but I think it's important because, um, you know, a number of reports we've received in this committee recently have told us that, you know, we're going to rely maybe more and more on uh, an immigrant workforce, particularly in the construction industry. And I think very counterbalancing facts in relation to that would, would help in terms of how many you know, what, what, um, what numbers of, of the Irish workforce or labour force are working in the other EU 26 or 27 states? That would be use, very useful information to, to let people know that it's not just a one-way flow, but actually it works two ways. Politically, I think that's important. In relation to, um, you know, we've had the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council here um, on a number of occasions. They tell us that... Um, the implementation of the CCCTB would have far more negative consequences for our economy than Brexit, even. Um, maybe if you could speak to that. Um, in relation to, I mean, it's a, repeated, it's a repeated theme in presentations to this committee, which we, we take on board and we listen to. It concerns Ireland's uh, perceived over-dependence uh, over and vulnerability to corporation tax receipts from a small number of um, multinational companies. Do you think that this issue could be adequately addressed by siphoning off more uh, tax income into this rainy day fund that has been established? Um, you talk about the over, I mean, to some degree, and I mean this very respectfully, it's, 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 it's very interesting to hear your report because it, it chimes with a number of reports that this committee receives. It chimes with a number of the themes that arise in them, the, you know, the over-reliance on corporation tax, overspending on, on health, and uh, you know, if that continues, then the volatility uh, um, uh, in, in future in terms of uh, public spending. We know all that. What's your suggested solution? OK, 
Okay? So these reports are really interesting, but what do we do? What advice do you give government? So this, these reports are very good overviews, um, but what do we do? You know, this over-reliance on corporation tax. So tell us, you know, what policy changes aside things from things like the Rainy Day Fund? Um, just two more uh, questions. Um, yeah, you highlight the non-performing loans, and that's fine. Like, from an accountant's point of view, very objective, we should be dealing with non-performing loans. But a lot of these are mortgages. People are in their homes. You put them out of their homes, they have to rent homes at colossally high rental uh, costs, in Dublin particularly. So you just go from the frying pan into the fire. There is a particular context to this, um, and I'm not sure if you appreciate that enough that it's one thing talking clinically about non-performing loans, but there are realities, there are people who live behind those loans. It has been the practice and objective of successive Irish governments to keep people in their homes. Um, so could you speak to that? Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. I... <clears throat> Thank you very much, Deputy Lahart. Um, you have asked several questions, which some of them I don't think that belong to the remit of the Commission. That's right? what I was afraid of. The yeah. first one in particular, when it comes to possible actions by the ECB and the, and the, the interest rate policy, I must say that, uh, as you know, the Commission usually does not comment on the, on the uh, decisions taken by the, by the ECB. I can, let's say, refer to what um, um, Mr. Draghi said a few days ago, that, uh, I mean, I think that the, in, the, in the ECB, they follow very closely the economic developments. They are aware of, of the developments, not only in the real economy, but also concerning inflation. And I think that, in my view, they are, let's say, taking all this information into account when it comes to the normalization of the monetary policy. Therefore, uh, I suppose that um, the, the, the ECB will adjust its uh, rate policy, interest rate policy, in accordance to the economic environment. Uh, and, and then the question is, I, we have to take into account that uh, sometimes the impact of the monetary policy on the specific conditions concerning mortgages in a country, the, it is not passed through immediately and fully. It depends on, uh, of course, the, the policies of the banks, the business model of the banks, depends on a series of, let's say, macroeconomic uh, stability and financial stability policies implemented by the supervisor itself. So this is something which, uh, of course, I mean, I think it would be good news in case the economy would, let's say, recover very quickly, and then this would allow the normalization of the interest rates by the ECB, but in my view, so far, according to what uh, Mr. Draghi has already explained uh, some days ago, I think that it's going to take, let's say, to go high in hand, hand in hand simultaneously with the macroeconomic environment. Uh, concerning uh, figures on immigration, so the number of, uh, of uh, Irish nationals living aside, as outside and EU nationals living in the in Ireland. I know that this information exists, but I don't have it with me. So we are very pleased to, to, to send this information to you. I have seen this information for a number of countries, and I think that this information exists in the same way that it exists here concerning the number of uh, EU nationals living uh, here in, in Ireland. The, concerning the implementation of the, of the common corporate tax base, I would say that uh, precisely the idea with this, by the Commission with this, uh, with this uh, proposal has been to avoid a kind of, let's say, race to the bottom in which, in which uh, mm -hmm. companies in EU can use different criteria to define the corporate tax base in order to elude or to avoid taxation. I, I mean, I think that uh, first, 
Personally, I don't think that um, the, the introduction of the CCTV is going to be more harmful than other shocks. It depends on how, how the, the whole system would adapt. But uh, in any case, the, the, let's say the, the idea or the proposal that the Commission has in mind with uh, homogenizing and harmonizing the, 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 uh, the, the corporate tax base is precisely to avoid that there is a kind of, let's say, race to the bottom so that finally we have just the opposite effect that we try to, to have, that is in principle to stabilize the, the, the amounts or the, the levels of tax, tax revenues which are necessary in order to, to uh, let's say, finance um, expenditure. And of course, I think that um, the, if I understood well your question concerning the rainy day fund, the idea precisely is, and I think that this is, this is what the, the, the goal of the authorities, is precisely to use all the extra revenues in good times in order to afford the possibility to, to have more expenditure or less taxation in bad times. Therefore, yeah. Is it an effective way of reducing our perceived vulnerability or reliance? Indeed, okay. indeed, because, because uh, precisely the, the idea, let's say, one of the vulnerabilities of the Irish economy is that the Irish economy is a, a small open economy, therefore subject to, to shocks, yeah. to, shocks mm -hmm. to external shocks, therefore showing that the economy, that the government, that public finances are sound enough in order to, let's say, uh, compensate or fight against these shocks without endangering the, the sustainability, I think that this is important in order to reduce vulnerabilities. Um, what to do with this report? I think that what we have to do with this report, not only here, but uh, in general the country is, and this is the reason why I'm here, is to listen to you, to have your views concerning our analysis. You don't need to agree with the analysis. What we would like to understand is what are your views with respect to different issues, because what we want to do now is to open, as I said, a dialogue period in which there is this exchange between the Commission and the different stakeholders, of course the authorities, of course the Parliament, in which we try to arrive to a common diagnosis, so that we, from there we can agree on certain policies, which should be reflected in the national reform program, that if I am not uh, mistaken, will be discussed and presented to this, to this Parliament. So, and there the government will present what are the, their, uh, their proposals, policy proposals, in order to, let's say, address this, this diagnosis, these this vulnerabilities of these, uh, these uh, challenges that uh, have been identified by the, by the report. Concerning rental prices, I think that the report makes a very clear analysis and warns about the, the fact that uh, rental prices rents are increasing and have increased by more than, by more than 20 percent um, and therefore I mean this is linked to the fact that is also a fact identifying the report in which uh, is clear that um, there is an undersupply of housing which is affecting not only the, 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 the pricing of new houses and the prices the prices of housing but also rents and therefore the report draws the attention of the authorities and, and the, 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 the government in order to uh, discuss policies in order to reduce, the, to increase, sorry, this, uh, this supply of housing. The relationship with non-performing loans is clear that uh, the idea with reducing non-performing loans is not to put people in the street, but rather to, to, let's say, help them in order to reduce or to, 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 to repay the mortgages and at the same time without, without 
uh, or supporting the profitability of the of the banks. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, next indicating to me was Deputy Brown. Uh, I'd like to welcome the uh, Deputy Director General and his, his colleagues. Uh, just ask you first of all, um, just in relation to, to, to the report, the full report, um, is it not to some extent a total cop-out in relation to our country having to deal with Brexit? I mean, we're following the, the, obviously what's happening in the British Parliament almost on an hourly basis. We can't believe that we're in the situation that we're in. Uh, we were in last night. We have a debate on Brexit coming up later on this evening, which a number of us will be speaking at. But you, in this report, you say, you know, you, you base your projections on the status quo. Uh, but, I mean, surely that's a total cop-out. This is a cataclysmic event for our country uh, because we're so intertwined with the British economy. And the publication this morning of uh, the suggested no-deal uh, British tariffs, uh, I mean, it has caused grave anxiety and anguish in our farming community, in our business community. And surely, um, like, th there should be some attempt, uh, and you mentioned growth, for example. So we have an amazing growth figure, like in recent years, you're 7% or whatever, totally a lot higher than nearly all of our, or all of our EU partners. And yet we, you know, we have projections now from the Central Bank, from, uh, from uh, Fiscal Council, from the other bodies that brief us, that um, you know, this could collapse to zero uh, by 2020 and so on. So we're, we're faced almost with an existential threat to our, our economy, but that isn't apparent in your report whatsoever, as far as I can see. Uh, you're, you're, you're just uh, going on as if it's not going to happen. Now, we are faced also with the possibility, and we uh, heard our Sinn Féin colleagues this morning asking uh, in relation to a redress fund to support our business, support our farmers. We've, we've, uh, we've had uh, people asking for the rainy day fund to be utilised in this regard, but that we almost certainly are going to have some kind of, uh, of, an, of a second budget if there is any kind of, uh, you know, uh, exit, uh, 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 no deal uh, Brexit in the next couple of weeks. So uh, isn't a lot of what, therefore, this, is premised, this report here is premised on, uh, in actual fact, doesn't really address the challenge we face. Because it is absolutely profound, uh, the fact that within our island is part of the other economy. We're so intertwined, entirely, literally, in our families in uh, every conceivable way uh, with the e UK and with its <coughs> destiny. Uh, that uh, you know the biggest challenge for us since um, probably the, the period of the, in our hundred years independent history since the Second World War. So I don't see that reflected in this. Can I just say, just secondly, um, I know it's your overall assessment at the end here. You say uh, public and private debt. Um, you know, you, you draw attention to that. Uh, you know, they still remain very elevated. Um, and we've had, you know, we've had our concerns about the levels of household debt, of private sector debt, uh, the still the level of the national debt, which of course resulted from uh, the imposition of certain um, uh, policies by Europe on, on our country uh, in the period after 2011. Uh, and we're still facing that, uh, you know, and in addition to this, we have to, we have to address this, this Brexit situation. So you, that seems to be your, your, your very fundamental, uh, your fun, uh, fundamental uh, final assessment that, and we're, we're very aware of that, I think, that of the high levels of both private debt. A lot of it seems to relate to housing. I mean, why are you not prepared to go strong, much more strongly and say housing in this, you know, in this particular economy, it's a dysfunctional market. Like uh, we, many of us regard it as a completely dysfunctional market, that it's not delivering a fundamental basic uh, economic product for the public in this country at affordable prices. Uh, and it's, you know, we, we've had eight, ten years of this total, well, we've had it all during our history, actually, because it goes boom to bust to boom and so on and so forth. But it's our people, the people we represent, who suffer. So why aren't you much more strong on that and saying, you know, you need to sort out your dysfunctional uh, uh, housing market? And, and uh, just to ask you then, just thirdly, you say that since 2011, since the semester started, 79% of recommendations have been delivered on to some extent in different budgets and by the actions of different governments. So the other 21%, what, what, would, be, what would stand out in recommendations to, that the government just, uh, if you like, blithely ignored? Um, and uh, just maybe one, one brief final point. 
yeah, on, on uh, page nine yeah, of your own report there, uh, you, like, you, you talk again about wealth inequality. Again, it's related a lot to the property market, to the housing market, uh, but I think you, 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 know, you put us again among the most unequal uh, countries in the 28 and 27 if Brexit happens. Um, and again, isn't that a very uh, profound situation uh, that we score so uh, relatively badly in that area that again maybe you should highlight more? Uh, so the, they'd be some of the concerns I would have uh, with the report. But thanks for the report. It's very stimulating and, and very interesting and it, it echoes many of the other briefings that we get from our own domestic agencies. Uh, thanks, Ken. Yeah, thank or you very much, Deputy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Brosan. Um, Several, several, the, I mean, I'm going to start by the most important question because the first one you have put into question, I mean, why to, to prepare this report without, without looking at Brexit? Uh, I think that um, the, the, the first, the first uh, uh, approach to this, to this question is, would be to say, okay, if we see what happened yesterday, all the uncertainties we have with respect to what uh, may happen today, or tomorrow and in the coming days, in the coming days you would agree that it was extremely difficult and it is extremely difficult at the current juncture to consider alternative scenarios. So we simply don't know. And since we simply don't know, instead of preparing N reports, which one per, per scenario, what we have done is to consider, as I said, that the economic relationships between the European Union and the UK will not change in the sense that there are not disruptions in, in trade or changes, fundamental changes in the, in the way trade will take place. Of course, that would be the case if there would be a transition period in the coming two or three years. That would be the case. But we don't know. Uh, so I agree with you that there is a risk, and I think that the risk has been clearly highlighted in the report, that all what we say in the report has a downside risk, which is the possibility of a non-deal or, or any other alternative scenario concerning the relationship between the EU and the UK. Now, I agree that uh, perhaps in some months, we have to reconsider a number of priorities or challenges. I agree with you. But in the meantime, the question is, does, the, does this imply that the report is not useful, that the report, let's say, does not address fundamental issues? I would not say that. Because with Brexit or without Brexit, we will have the problem, one of the problems highlighted in the report, is the low productivity of domestic indigenous companies that need, a need, uh, that need a series of policies related to skills, to human capital, to knowledge capital. So this will be needed in any case. This challenge will be there in any case. Another, another issue that will be fundamental in any case is to keep sound public finances. Coming back to the existence of the rainy fund, coming back to the need to buffers, while in order to increase, to improve the resilience and the, let's say, to reduce vulnerabilities of the Irish economy. I think that these challenges will always be there with or without Brexit. And I would say more, tackling these challenges will be, let's say, will make easier to deal with unfavorable scenarios in the case of Brexit. So that's the reason why we have considered that we didn't need to consider or to, let's say, spell out all the alternative scenarios simply because we don't know. And then we have preferred to work in a kind of, let's say, central scenario in which we can, uh, let's say, analyze the different challenges, the different issues, the main problems in every market concerning concerning the Irish economy. And then we know that all this is to some extent, or to a large extent, conditional to the kind of Brexit is going to materialize. But even today, we don't know. Even today, we don't know. 
So I think that this is, and of course we are aware of the impact that uh, the imposition of certain tariffs on the side of the UK may have. And of course the Commission has made already a series of, let's say, preparations in order to make, in the worst case scenario, make trade as fluid as possible. And this has been decisions taken unilaterally by the, by the Commission. And of course, I know that in the, in the country, the government is also taking steps and considering a series of measures, implementing a series of measures in order to, let's say, reduce in the case, in the case, the frictions, the possible frictions in trade. Uh, public and private debt is still high, and this is related to the fact that so the, 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 we have to be aware that the, the, the level of debt is high because in front of a, a shock, if we come, <clears throat> I mean, if we start with levels of debt which are too high, we, don't know, we will not have room for maneuver in order to deal with this, with this shock. Uh, housing market is dysfunctional. Well, I don't think that uh, in the report we even suggest this possibility. What we are saying in the report is that there is an undersupply of housing and that this undersupply of housing is sometimes even related to the lack of skills, to the lack to the shortages in labor in, labor in, the, in the country. And we also say because at the end of the day whether a market is dysfunctional or not depends on the regulatory framework and we also recognize that the government has taken a series of steps in order to let's say reduce the regulatory barriers that could let's say prevent prevent um, the development of the of the sector concerning the the country specific recommendations in which uh, let's say the progress in implementing them has been more limited i would say that uh, they, are, they are on the one hand the measures related to the sustainability of public finances, in particular to, let's say, increase the cost effectiveness of, the, of health care. They are the, the expenditures have increased rapidly without, let's say, clear improvements in the, in the quality or clear reasons behind, behind this, this increase, like aging or the fact that uh, diseases have become more important, more grave. Uh, and then I think that this is related to the, to, the first, to, the, to the first question. There we still find that uh, there have not been enough, let's say, measures in order to stimulate the productivity of domestic firms. Because it is becoming more productive that you even can tackle the increasing tariffs. Huh? So these are the two areas in which, in which we think that the progress has been more limited. Thank you very much for that. Uh, next I have Deputy O'Brien. Uh, two of the questions I was going to ask were asked by previous speakers so I won't repeat them. Um, but I, I would like to maybe just touch on what Deputy Lehart said in relation to the non-performing loans. Um, and obviously you raised that as a concern in the uh, report. And I think Deputy Lehart put it very well when he said that there is a, a political consensus within this state. Um, while we recognize that non-performing loans is an issue, how we're uh, addressing them is a concern to many of us. Um, we're seeing those lo loans being sold to vulture funds. Um, and there is a feeling, and as I said, a consensus, I think within all political parties that we would do everything we could to help those indebted mortgage holders to remain in their properties. Um, and to do otherwise would only um, worsen the housing situation we have here. So there is a balance in how we address that, um, how we address the issue of non-performing loans and to continue to reduce them while not impacting on the housing crisis uh, and that's something that we have to try and get to grips with um, from a policy point of view. Can I touch on the rainy day fund? You mentioned the rainy day fund. 
Um, I have concerns around the Rainy Day Fund. Um, I would be uh, a member of one of the parties who are opposed to the establishment of the Rainy Day Fund. Um, some of the reasons uh, we've already outlined, we're in the middle of a, cr a crisis across many sectors in, in the uh, Irish economy, particularly housing and health. And to establish the Rainy Day Fund at this time, we don't think is, is the, the prudent thing to do. We also have some concerns around the legislation which the government has produced in establishing the Rainy Day Fund. If you look at the legislation, it says that you can, the withdrawal mechanisms for the uh, Rainy Day Fund are in three circumstances. One is to remedy exceptional circumstances. One is capital injection into the banking sector, and the third one is to support major uh, structural, restructural reforms. So our reading of the legislation is that it, the Rainy Day Fund cannot be used as a stabilization mechanism, that it's not counter-cyclical, that you cannot use it on general spending above the expenditure benchmark, uh, and therefore if you were to use it for the purposes set out in the legislation, exceptional circumstances, and if you look at what exceptional circumstances, the definition of that, the only definitions we can find are related to ter terrorism and migration flow. So we have concerns that in order to withdraw money from that particular fund, we would actually have to seek uh, approval from the European Commission. Uh, and there is no indication from the government, despite being re asked repeatedly, whether any discussions have taken place with the uh, European Commission on our ability to withdraw funds from that. So maybe you could just give me some commentary mm -hmm. on that mm -hmm. and your analysis mm -hmm. of it. The other area which I, I found interesting is you mentioned the National Development Plan. And in your report, you speak of the importance of the National Development Plan. You talk about uh, the need to underpin the National Development Plan by a robust monitoring system, adequately resourced departments, and a sound system of project selection. So can I take from that that you have concerns around the current monitoring system which is in place? Um, when you talk about adequately resourced departments, are you talking about uh, personnel, finances, skills, labour, exactly what resources are we talking about need to be put in place? And also the sound system of project selection. Are there concerns around the systems that we are currently using in project selection? Um, and if you can just make some comments on that as well. Thank you. Uh, on MPLs, perhaps in my in my introductory statement, I had been to let's say uh, too too short, huh? because in the report we make reference, clear reference to the measures that the authorities have introduced to provide support to vulnerable uh, borrowers, which are in our, who, who are in arrears. So therefore. Uh, we, we, on this, we think that, um, so we are not saying that the MPLs have to be reduced at any cost. Huh? I think that, uh, of course, borrowers, vulnerable borrowers have to be protected. And I think that this is, in, I thought that it was clear in the report, but, um, but of course, I take note that perhaps it's not that clear. Huh? So, so I think that um, it is important that we, I mean, there is a need also to, to see the way that um, we can alleviate the impact of MPLs workouts on households which face severe, severe difficulties. So on this, I think I, I agree with you that the reduction of MPLs have to, be, have to balance both concerns. On the one hand, the profitability and the soundness of the financial sector, but on the other hand, let's say, the vulnerabilities or the vulnerable, uh, the, the, the situation of, of vulnerable borrowers. Uh, concerning, concerning the use of the rainy day fund, the, the rainy day fund, I think that, so the, the flexibility clauses you have mentioned, 
So these exceptional clauses are on top of the flexibility that is embedded in the Stability and Growth Pact itself. So you have mentioned that this Renity Fund would be used in case of a kind of, let's say, economic uh, disruption. So in the case of, of, uh, of shocks. In that case, what happens is that the economy goes from the, let's say, positive phase of the cycle, as we are now, to a kind of, let's say, recession. And in that case, the flexibility, the Stability and Growth Pact has enough flexibility when calculating the, the uh, expenditure benchmark. So, so it's not only for exceptional circumstances, but also the flexibility also kicks in in function of the phase of the cycle. It's not the same. So the, the restrictions to the, to the expenditure imposed by the expenditure benchmark are not the same for a country which is at the MTO, which is the case of Ireland, with a declining debt, which is the case of Ireland. And for instance, which could be the case of Ireland in front of a shock, becoming, so going from a positive or zero output gap to a negative output gap, then the matrix that the Commission uses in agreement with the member states allows for, let's say, much more room for maneuver than in the other case. Even if there is no, I mean, if there is no one of these exceptional circumstances. Eh? Can the funding be used on general expenditure without the permission of the European Commission? I mean, what the European Commission is going to, to say, for instance, next, uh, in the next round on the country specific recommendations, to a country, it may not be Ireland, but to a country, is uh, you should contain the increase of expenditure net of, uh, of uh, um, discretionary revenue, so the, the, what we call the, the, the expenditure benchmark, you should uh, keep the increase of these expenditures below one level, one percentage. This percentage depends on the, on the one hand, what are the circumstances of the country, so what is the fiscal position of the country, on the one hand, and on the other hand, depends on the, um, the position of this in the cycle of the country. Okay. So, so if a country enters into recession, so that the output gap becomes negative, the requirements are less stricted, the, stricter than in, the, in a case in which you have a country with very high growth, so positive output gap, and a country with high level of debt, and a country which is far from the MTO, from the, from the structural equilibrium. Okay. So, so, and this is the kind of flexibility which is already embedded in the pact. Okay. Uh, the National yeah, Development Plan. Yeah, very briefly, because, I mean, we are not concerned about uh, specific monitoring or selection what we are concerned is, I mean, we are not concerned, what we are saying is that, of course, this, it is important to be able to identify what are the investment priorities. And the country report contributes to this identification, and we expect to discuss with the authorities, because perhaps the priorities we are proposing are not exactly the priorities the authorities are perceiving. So, and what the, the, the report says is that this uh, national development plan should be used precisely in order to, uh, let's say, finance these priorities, including housing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next is Deputy Ryan. Uh, Mr. Martinez Mondegay, many thanks for coming in with your country report. Uh, I, I recall, I think we were here last year, and it's a very useful part of our process, and, and it's very much appreciated. I have a slight difficulty maybe that I might be repeating, I think, some of the things I said last year, but hopefully that, that, that is uh, the nature of politics. Uh, and I have a particular problem. I will have to go home this evening, late, because we work hard in politics, but I will arrive home to my beloved wife and I will kiss her on the cheek and she'll ask me what should I do today and I'll say, well, honey, I discovered 
that you are underutilized, underused human capacity. <laughs> Is her work less important than mine? <laughs> Mr. Mungin. I mean, when we say, when we talk about the low participation of women, we are not uh, talking about, a, let's say, personal decision to do certain things to others. It's to what extent there is all the means, there are all the means for the people to take the, their decisions, the pers their personal decisions. So I don't think that we are simply saying that the, the women that do not work are underutilized. No. What we are, what we are flagging is the fact that uh, women participation in this country is below the, women, the participation of women in the labor market in other countries. And in principle, this is a personal choice, it's a social choice. But what we are asking is to what extent there are barriers that could prevent women from participating in the labor market. This is perhaps uh, is, is a, is a way to, let's say, summarize something in a sentence, which is we understand much more complex than that, but we are not flagging at all that uh, women that decide, decide. I, think I have a problem. I think the Commission are. I think the Commission want to pursue and promote policies. I agree with you fully. We should not interfere in the choice. And every family and every situation is different. And I would be in no way judgmental, although that language is judgmental against my wife. She is okay. under huge human capacity. You should stop that. But more importantly, we should be neutral in what choice the people make. And my fear is that always the economic aspect of your decision making promotes in intervention in that choice in a way that promotes one decision versus another. And that will, if we continue that for 20, 30 years, when my children get to the age when they have to decide what they do, they could be in an environment where it's impossible to make the choice where you have favored one choice over the other so much that it's economically impossible, that the price of housing goes up so much because you are promoting everyone working as much as possible, that creates an environment where it's impossible to have the free choice because my children will not be able to live in this city, in a city where everyone has dual income, and then the house of prices goes up to reflect that. You will interfere in that freedom of choice in a way that I think I don't agree with. Well, uh, I think that um, you, are, you are assuming several things. Eh? You are assuming that the fact that people work more create, let's say, supply constraints elsewhere. And I don't see the case. So I think that uh, the fact that people work more, work, participate more in the labor market, per first, is not bad per se. As I said, for me, what is bad is when somebody wants to participate in the labor market and cannot because there are certain constraints that do not allow him or she to participate in the labor market. True, but This is we, what worries me. About, and what worries me is that we've created a tax system through our individualization tax system and we have not individualized our social welfare system that make it increasingly difficult. Now, there's a whole variety of reasons behind and every family is best to make that choice. We should not be interfering. All the, everything the Commission does, and I think it comes from a Commission philosophy that comes maybe from those countries where you have a declining population, we have a very young population, maybe one of the reasons of differences, we have a dramatically younger population than any other European country. There's all sorts of different circumstances. But everything I read from the Commission and the OECD is in promoting labour market activation at all costs as your big priority, you do not value non-market labour work. You never mention it, you never support it, you never suggest we should set up an economic model which is in any way protects that most valuable work in my mind. And it's clear that that's the Commission's orientation. I don't believe you should, well, I disagree with it as a... I mean, I, I, I can understand that you disagree with the Commission, but what I would like to understand is on what you disagree, because I think that the final goal of any policymaker, be it the Commission, be it the government, is to increase living standards while, let's say, keeping, keeping uh, the best possible egalitarian distribution of income. I would say that this is... These are the, and I think that no both, I mean, in principle, these are two objectives which are, 
in general agreeable for almost right. everybody. I suppose I disagree with the fundamental economic analysis that does not see caring work as labour market participation. Then I, I, I hadn't finished. So this is the first thing. So we understand that in order to improve living standards, it's good that people participate in the labour market. And the only thing we are saying is not that everybody should participate, should be obliged to participate in the labour market. What we are saying is that if there are barriers for people to participate in the labour market, these barriers should be dismantled, which is, I think, basically different. Okay. So I have two other points. I don't labour on okay. uh, labour. Um, two other points, if I can. It, I, I don't know. I, I understand you cannot influence ECB's uh, decision making, but one of the issues for us in this housing crisis, which is a critical uh, problem, particularly in our, in our cities, is, is to move to change our housing model. To do that, we need models of cost rental housing, where we, we, we can public land is used in the market to build long-term rental, publicly owned housing, which, where the cost of the construction is covered by the rental agreement over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Restrict, we're, we're being restricted in that regard at the moment from the Eurostat or the, the European Statistics Office assessment of whether that is state borrowing or what, what's the nature of the borrowing. It is critical for us, in my mind, in a house, solving a housing problem, not just to rely on increasing the volume of private market housing to be sold, or indeed, just going back to the old social housing model, this cost rental model which exists in the likes of Vienna and Holland, where they historically were allowed by Eurostat to be, to, for the borrowing to take place, and now I'm told it's stopped, it's, it's restricted. Does the Commission have any influence in that regard to allow such financing models of public rental affordable housing? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, let me, let me say that the Commission has not, let's say, any preference concerning the ownership model of the housing market in different member states. We, we know that in certain member states there is a majority, because there are certain uh, social choices made, a majority of people who are owner and in other member states, if I remember well, in countries like uh, Spain or Portugal, the number of owners uh, is uh, above clearly 80% and even close to 90%, while in other countries, in Central Europe, they have gone more for the model of rental market, so that 50% of the of the households are renting. On this, the Commission has not, let's say, preferences or views concerning whether it is better the renting or, 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 uh, or owing a, a house. Now, the, the, question, the question is, to what extent, I mean, for us, the key issue is to understand what is behind the dynamics of prices, both in the, in the ownership in the owner model and in the renter model because and this is the, the important thing so to know whether there are bottlenecks in the case of the supply whether it is land or not whether they are certain let's say regulatory um, regulatory uh, constraints that prevent housing in one way or the other either for ownership or for or for renting developing this is what and i think that this is what the commission is trying to do in the country report precisely is to identify why house prices grow faster in one country than the other whether we have a problem of demand we have a problem of supply if we have a problem of supply where this problem comes from whether it comes from the Mm, regulatory uh, a question or a regulatory issue or it comes from from kind of let's say uh, uh, labor shortages whatever so this is what we want to do what we try to do this is what we try to do concerning social housing i think that uh, in the particular case of the report uh, uh, for island we have, we have also highlighted the shortages that exist in the provision of social housing in, uh, in, uh, in the country, that in spite of the efforts of the government, uh, which I uh, think that uh, foresee to, to, uh, to, to, to build something like 20,000 
units, but the demand is much higher still. So, so what we see in the case of Ireland is a lag in the supply catching the demand. Okay. Last question for Cancher, very briefly, very briefly. Um, the Commission has done, the, the European institutions have done a really good job in the 2030 climate package. I'm a Green, Green Party member. Um, the governance structure, the 2030 shared targets. Uh, you're right to say that one of the big fiscal risks for us, our, our fiscal advisor council said the same, is not meeting our climate targets. They, they estimate it as high risk with high impact. Mm -hmm. Can you, if you don't have it now, could you report back to us within our semester system on what the Commission's best estimate would be currently as to what the, financial, the fiscal risk is for Ireland in 2025-2030 in, on the current projections of our climate emissions? And can you give me a best Commission estimate, if not here today, no. but, but as part of our, our, of our own process in assessing our National Energy and Climate Action Plan under the governance rules, it would be very useful to have a Commission estimate of how much compliance costs we're going to have, not just fines, but the yeah, use yeah. of credits, use of other mechanisms. Can you give us a best estimate of what that financial risk is over the next 10-year horizon? I, uh, the only thing I can tell you very honestly is that I don't have this. Uh, this uh, I know. I know that there is a risk. There is a clear risk, and it's not a small risk in monetary terms, but uh, I know that there is, there is uh, this risk. I don't know whether my colleagues have any, any let's say, data, but of course I will contact my colleagues in, in climate and uh, environment in order to see the way to channel to you this. It, this. I appreciate that. It would be very useful would, as part of our iterative process. We with would actually like if you obviously would supply that to the, the committee as well. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and next is Deputy Boyd Barish. Thanks. Uh, uh, to uh, the Commission and the team for their work and their presence. Um, just to follow on from De Deputy Bruin's uh, references to Brexit, I mean, there is in the current situation, literally the day that we speak, something slightly surreal about uh, discussing the economic situation in Ireland with an assumption technical or otherwise, uh, that things remain the same um, uh, when there's a very significant chance that we're going to get a shock. Uh, and uh, I would like to know what you can say about what discussions you've had in terms of Europe's response uh, in the event of that shock. It may be limited, but I, I, I'd like to know. I mean, today, for example, Britain has laid out some of its uh, stall in terms of what it intends to do. Uh, one aspect of that, the tariffs uh, in terms of east-west trade would be extraordinarily damaging to certain export sectors here, particularly uh, beef. Um, and uh, I mean, one thing that I think everybody would want to know in this country is, is there going to be extraordinary and substantial assistance from uh, the European Union uh, in the event that we take a massive hit uh, because of those tariffs. The second uh, aspect of that, probably even more important, well it is, I think I would say it is more important, uh, is on the north-south border issue. Uh, Britain has said something today that notwithstanding the tariffs threat, which is a very big problem, is actually quite welcome news, which is they don't intend to put tariffs, checks or controls north-south uh, in the event of a crash out Brexit. Um, now, Europe has played its cards pretty close to its chest on this issue. We have been asking and asking the government what Europe is going to do in the event of a crash out. And we all hope there will be a deal, but if there isn't a deal, we need to know, uh, is Europe going to insist on checks, controls, border infrastructure, north, south, in order to protect the integrity of the European single market? Uh, because I would say to you that would be very damaging uh, and mustn't happen. And indeed, there will be active resistance to it, 
uh, and it would endanger the peace in this country in a very, very serious and existential way. So can you shed any light on that, given that Britain at now, at least on that front, has laid out its stall, can Europe lay out its stall? That's the first question. Secondly, the, um, I mean, the reports are very interesting, and your analysis, a lot of it, I agree with, okay, uh, in terms of the broad brush strokes of areas that you identify as needing investment, imbalances, and so on, mm. the debt situation, housing situation, health overspends, uh, some of the key areas, decarbonisation, uh, childcare, uh, and so on, okay? But I do, you know, find it a little bit rich, to be honest, for, the, for Europe to point these things out, which most of us are aware, when a lot of those imbalances and deficits uh, result precisely from demands that the Commission put on us uh, in the post-2008 uh, period during the Troika program. You know, have you any comment on that? I mean, if you take the deficit, which you rightly allude to, in public housing, that, I mean, the, the, the crisis in public housing predated 2008, but, but the actions of uh, the Commission directly impacted on that. Uh, of the Troika, which included the Commission. Uh, so our public housing program came to a complete standstill for effectively a decade because of demands that you put on us. And even now, in terms of our capacity to catch up in that area, in the area of childcare, in the area of decarbonisation, the five billion or so we're paying out in debt repayments on a grossly inflated debt because of you know, the, your rules, very seriously hamper our ability to address those uh, capital infrastructure deficits. Uh, so what do you have to say about that? Uh, and, and particularly in the light of Brexit, don't you think we deserve a bit of a debt interest holiday on some of that excessive debt so that we would actually have the funds to deal with some of these uh, math, you know, very, very significant uh, deficits? very last uh, question I had was... Um, uh, about when you said that there's skill shortages uh, and so on and bottlenecks and possible overheating and so on uh, related to that. Uh, have you anything to say about wages and precarity in that regard? You mentioned childcare and I agree with you. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but have you anything to say about wages and precarity? Okay, because... Uh, one of the big obstacles for people going back to work is low levels of pay and very precarious work, uh, lack of uh, job security and so on. That hampers people making the decision to go back into the workplace, <coughs> which we clearly need in a whole number of sectors that you've rightly identified. Thank you very much, Deputy. Okay, <coughs> thank you. Um, on Brexit, I think that, I mean, I could go to the, to the long list of uh, measures that, and decisions that the, the Commission has taken, but they are public, and of course we can, we can provide them to you with, in the framework of the preparedness. The Commission has identified a number of sectors, a number of issues, including air transport, including electricity, including, including financial markets, in which, um, let's say, Contingency plans have to be, uh, should be implemented. I think that this has been identified by the Commission. The Commission has distributed a series of uh, documents at the sectoral and the country level in order to raise awareness of the, of the different uh, also governments, governments, but also the private sector in order to prepare for this, uh, for this possibility. I think, and I have seen the the, the statement of your minister yesterday, or the day before yesterday, uh, precisely enumerating the number of measures and the preparedness that the Irish government is, uh, uh, w w the, the, the preparedness measures that the government is taking. Of course, it's clear that the, that the private sector has also to, to get ready to this, to this uh, possibility. Uh, I mean, I would not go now to discuss what kind of measures uh, within the treaties and therefore preserving 
the essence of the treaties and doing what the treaties allow to do, in, even also, as mentioned by the, by the Minister Donoghue, on, on, um, uh, even on state aid. Uh, and in particular, you have mentioned the agri-food sector. So I don't think that this is the moment now to determine or explain what measures could be taken. Let's see exactly what is going on, and then let's see the magnitude of the shock, and then let's decide what kind of measures, as I say, within the treaties, because the treaties also envisage derogations. So within the treaties, and of course, preserving, preserving the, the principles of the treaties, and in particular, the functioning of the single market. And it's possible to tackle, to do many things within, within this, this framework. I mean, the, I think that uh, there, are, there, are, there have been very few institutions more aware of the importance of the, of the Irish border. I think that the, since the beginning, the negotiator, the chief negotiator, has established as priority precisely to guarantee, to allow for a soft let's say, or to prevent, I would say, rather, to prevent a hard, a hard border in, in, in Ireland. And this is the reason why we have the backstop as one, one of the principles together with the, with, the, with the guarantees of the preserving the rights of, uh, of the citizens. So I think that the Commission will do as much as it could do. Of course, the government the, the, the other governments, the member states, I think that would be a collective uh, action. But of course, I'm sure that the Commission will do, and is doing now, uh, in order to preserve and to, to, to avoid this uh, hard border. Uh, you said something that, um, uh, I, I mean, it's difficult for me to agree with that, is that the, the current situation in Ireland is due to the demands of the Troika during the program. My reading is that uh, first there was the housing bubble, the housing bubble burst, uh, the housing market collapsed, the construction sector collapsed, uh, Ireland was, let's say, uh, the, the access to markets in Ireland was cut, uh, and then um, the, the Troika, as you said, came lending money to, to Ireland, by the way, at interest rates which are not, let's say, particularly high. But again, as I said, um, it would be premature to say whether the member states would be ready to do in the future in function of the situation of the Brexit. But I must say that um, I don't think that the current situation of Ireland, which, by the way, is not very bad, I think that uh, uh, is, clear, is, out, uh, is clearly spelled out in the report, comes precisely because the requirements of the Troika, I think that the requirements of the Troika have nothing to do with the supply of undersupply of child care, of another, 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 let's say, uh, or other, other elements or other issues, which simply reflect choices to be made within the budget, which are, mm, these kind of choices have to be made uh, in every country when, when preparing the budget. Concerning skill shortages, what we are saying, and I think that uh, I tried to explain this in my introduction, is that what we see is, on the one hand, that in a number of sectors, and in particular sectors which require higher skill levels, on the one hand, and on the other hand, sectors like construction, which also require certain, let's say, uh, skills. Um, uh, in these sectors, we observe that there are labor shortages. At the same time, what we see is that wages are increasing, and therefore, we conclude that perhaps, that on the basis of our calculations, which, by the way, are made within the framework of the common agreed methodology, so the same methodology that applies to every member state, we consider that uh, Ireland is in the 
positive phase of the cycle. At the same time, I think that the report acknowledged something that you have mentioned, is that um, at the same time what we observe is that on the one hand, the participation of certain groups uh, of the population is low, therefore should be, as I said, not, not compulsory, but should, we should eliminate the, the barriers. And on the other hand, the report also refers to the fact that in Ireland, the number of people who are working part-time on an involuntary basis is also high, which would also suggest that perhaps there is a still some, let's say, labor under utilization. So this is the, the analysis of the of the cyclical position of the country we make. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Chambers. Thank you very much, Sharon, and thank you very much uh, to all of your team for, for being here to take questions from us. Uh, my first um, question is in relation to the attempts to reform EU tax policy and the uh, suggestion that we would move towards a qualified ma ma voting majority in relation to EU tax policy. Can you just, I suppose, outline to the committee the justification for that and then how do you reconcile uh, th that proposal uh, with the subsidiarity rules? Well, um, first, taxes are collected in order to finance expenditure, including the support of childcare or including the support of uh, healthcare. So these are the purpose of taxes. Or also the support to, let's say, more vulnerable uh, borrowers uh, in, the, in the housing market or to provide uh, social housing. So taxes is, is uh, the decision to, let's say, raise taxes is because we want to finance expenditure. And then what we see is that sometimes there is a mismatch between the expenditure and the taxes that should be collected in order to finance it. Second, we should not forget that uh, we are, uh, all of us, in the, in the single market where we have a series of freedoms, the freedom of movement of people, goods, services, and capital. And that um, what the Commission wants to avoid is precisely that uh, we end up in a kind of, let's say, competition across the member states in order to, let's say, attract capital one from the other instead of, let's say, creating the conditions in order for an efficient allocation of capital within the single market. So, and I think that this is, at the same time, I think that the Commission is fully respecting the, the subsidiarity because the Commission usually does not say how much taxes you have to collect from every, every possible alternative, but of course, sometimes the subsidiarity has to be consistent with the, the principle of, with the, with the principle, the general principle of maintaining the single market and preserving the four freedoms. Okay, I mean, I would, I would, in response to that, with respect, I would say that we, having been a member of the European Union since 1973, and always adhering to protecting the single market and, and all of the, the, the four freedoms and the values inherent in that, um, I think that it is an area of concern for Ireland. Uh, tax policy is a matter of competence for the Member State. It always has been. Um, there have been suggestions here, I think in the, in, sometimes in the paranoia of dealing with Brexit, there have been suggestions that in return for the solidarity offered to Ireland in the Brexit process, that pressure will come upon us to, I suppose, be more flexible uh, in reforming EU tax policy. And I certainly hope that that is not the case. Um, but I just, it's, I, it's I don't the, first, the first time I hear something like this. Eh? Well, it's, it's, so. been, it's been reported in the papers right across the European Union. So, I mean, it, is, uh, it has been discussed. Well, Chair, with respect, and it is my question, I understand you're chairing the meeting. Um, I'm putting the question out there and more making a statement. This, this is part of the conversation happening in this member state. <coughs> and I think we have to learn lessons from Brexit and that we shouldn't take for granted the sentiment among citizens in all member states and how they view the European Union and its reach and the changes that it is proposing. So whilst we might, you know, rubbish those suggestions, um, that is a concern 
whether it is reasonable or not. That is mm. a concern that's mm. there. And I would just caution that we, we should never disregard those concerns because they can grow, they can take root, uh, and they can cause problems further down the line. And I think we've learned a, we've learned a very important lesson from the Brexit process here in Ireland, uh, not to disregard the, the concerns of citizens. Um, and I just think it's, it's something just to bear in mind you know, as, we, as we move forward uh, and discussing these issues as a union and as a, as a community, all of us together. Um, that this, is, this would be an area of particular um, concern for Ireland and would be quite contentious if it were to progress in the manner that some member states would like it to progress. And I just want to put that on the record. Uh, can, can I ask a question in relation to, to Brexit? I know you've been asked this question by other members of the committee. And we have been pressing our own government to answer questions as to what level of discussion is happening at a commission level, specifically in relation to financial aid that would be available to Ireland in the event of a no-deal hard Brexit. And I, I would share Deputy Boyd Barrett's, um, you know, I suppose surprise and that your report on Ireland is based on the status quo maintaining. And I suppose because we are in the Brexit bubble and it's part of our daily discussions, that's hard to, the hope that we would maintain the status quo is, is, is dwindling. Um, and I think in that context, the report maybe may not stand to, to test, uh, you know, in the next number of weeks, things could change. Things are changing almost on an hourly basis. And for us here in Ireland, we will be looking to the European Union, to the Commission for support uh, if things go badly. And certainly as, as reports came today in terms of the tariff regime the UK are planning to impose in the event of a no deal, um, if that were to come to pass, our agriculture, our agri-food and our beef sector would be decimated in a matter of weeks. So we are really worried. And my question to the Commission is, what financial aid support will be available to us uh, the next day, the day after it happens, if it happens? Um, can I just, sorry, can sure. I just take account of the fact, because this is a tradition uh, which most committees, you have answered that question before, so I would ask you in answering that question, take account of what you've already said and answer as concisely as possible. No, I mean, I, I was going to be very concise. First, with respect to your previous, let's say, remarks, mm -hmm. uh, let me tell you that, um, of course, I'm taking good note, huh? this is the idea with uh, being, being in, this, in, in front of this committee, I also want to hear from you, mm -hmm. and then as an official, because I am only an official, I will, I will translate uh, your, your concerns to, to, my, to my political uh, masters. But, I mean, it's true that uh, we should not forget what is behind Brexit. Huh? Absolutely. And I think that the Commission has uh, present what is uh, very, uh, very in mind what is uh, going on with Brexit. And the question that I would also ask is to what extent what, uh, I mean, behind Brexit are many, many, many factors. Mm -hmm. I suppose that it's not um, very easy to identify a single element. But of course, be behind Brexit, there are people who felt unhappy. Unhappy. Yeah. And more than unhappy, left behind, yes. more than unhappy. It was not a question of happiness. Mm -hmm. It was more, more, let's say, a more substantive question. And then the question is, uh, also I would ask this, this question, what is the best way to help these people? Helping companies not to pay taxes or to pay very few taxes, or let's say helping the people in order to have the corresponding skills to be able to, to uh, transit uh, from one status from the other to the other in the labor market, from one sector to the other, to help their children to, to, to have good education. So th this is part of the picture that we should not, should not forget. And concerning Brexit, uh, you will allow me that at this moment, today, I mean, it would be, as I said, premature to say what kind of, let's say, financial support the Commission, and I would say more than the Commission, the EU, would be ready to grant. What I have heard, I have read, is the, all the measures that the, your government has in mind, and that uh, is, and if you, if you see the, 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 
the statement, they are not quantified. So, mm -hmm. so simply, I have referred to the possibility of flexibility within the treaties, but I think that everything now would be premature. So, so and can change in 24 hours, mm -hmm. okay? I suppose I mean, my question in that regard, I mean, that flexibility is great and we will, need flex we will need flexibility in terms of state aid rules here and within our own country. But separate from that, is it the intention of the Commission to provide some financial assistance, even if you cannot quantify? Is that, is that being discussed? I cannot, I cannot answer this question simply because we don't know whether it, this would be, even be needed. Eh? So. That, that leads me on then to my, my yeah, final, my final yeah, question, right. is just in relation to the multi-annual financial framework, the next budget that's being discussed currently, of great concern to Ireland is the potential for, for cohesion funding to be reduced yes. and also the potential for it's funding to the common agricultural policy to be, be reduced as well. Uh, in the context of Brexit, this is even more of a concern because we will need more assistance in those programmes. Um, can I ask, will you, will you take into consideration in discussing the MFF um, the extra demands that Brexit will, will bring and seek to try and sustain and maintain funding to those programmes? Well, in the case, in the discussions in the framework of the MFF, what we are discussing is the keys, mm -hmm. so the indicators we have to use in order to distribute the, the funds. And this is something that is, is not only the Commission, I think is the Member States, because this, this is being discussed in the, in the Council. So I think that the member states should be there also to, let's say, channel their... It's not the commission that uh, mm -hmm. represents a single member state. The commission makes a proposal, and this proposal is being discussed mm -hmm. in a table similar to this one with, 20, with, with the member states. Okay. 27. 27. But the point of clarification on those Maybe. discussions... What is, the, what is the status of those discussions? Where are they at? I With don't know Parliament. whether, I think that we have uh, the figure, no, not yet. No, I don't. No. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Now, Deputy Boyd Barris, you did, you did hang on to wait to come back in with a supplemental, so I want to let you back in with a, uh, sure. a, a quick... I have one very specific question. The, the, the housing crisis is the most acute uh, sort of domestic crisis we're facing at the moment and it's really I couldn't emphasize how bad it is for huge numbers of people whether they're on housing lists or just working and can't afford market prices market rents so one of the big issues for us as well as public housing council housing is affordable housing affordable purchase housing uh, and what I really want to know is what freedom and latitude do we have to develop an affordable purchase scheme where the prices, if you like, will be below market prices? The reason I'm asking, obviously, is because a lot of the fiscal uh, rules or uh, treaty rules say you can't distort the market. Now, it seems to me that we have to distort the market if we're going to deliver affordable housing because the market is dysfunctional and house prices in Dublin, for example, are on average €455,000. Mm -hmm. okay? So they're completely unaffordable for normal working families. And unless we can sell affordable houses, state-provided affordable houses, at in the region of about 200000 we can't deliver affordable housing. So is there a problem, I'm just asking you, is there a problem from the point of view of the Commission, the Euro European rules, in us providing below cost, below market affordable housing. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I think that the Commission has uh, nothing to regulate concerning social housing except to respect the competition rules. Mm, for that. instance, no, no, but uh, it's, not, it's not a question. So competition rules, and in particular stated rules, do not apply to money going from the market, from the government to the to the people, to the consumers, to the household, applies to the money going from the government to companies. Okay? So, in principle, I don't see why the Commission was going to put any problem because um, in Ireland, it is, uh, the, somebody takes a decision to subsidize part of the, of the house as long as the subsidy goes to the, to the household, not to the company. Okay? Okay. 
Another thing is the cost of this and how you finance this cost. But this is, this is a choice, again, as I said, that you make within the budget. So within the budget, you decide, okay, I, mm, I prioritize investment in, in highways and less uh, social housing and more childcare. So, but this is a decision that is in your hands, it's not uh, okay. in the hands of the Commission. Thank you very much. Now, um, I, just before I, I, we conclude, I just there's one area that I wanted to touch on myself, and in actual fact, Deputy Chambers alluded to it in her contribution, uh, and it is the area of taxation and subsidiarity in relation to your comments. Uh, I'm a, a very strong pro-European, very strong believer in uh, the EU, um, but the one thing I would say, and the one thing I would draw attention always, and I appreciate that your job as an official effectively is to convey back the views from member states into the political <coughs> side of it. The support which Ireland has received from the European Union in relation to the Brexit situation is, is absolutely magnificent. It's a two-way street, though. Um, the, it's not a support of the EU for Ireland's position. It is Ireland, as an equal member of the European Union, having a position which is to the benefit of all member states. So there is no are expected of any quid pro quos. And I think we need to be careful, genuinely careful, I think sometimes in the fact that there are always stories out there as to why things are being done. But it is my firm belief that the main reason that the uh, negotiations on the European side went very well and a very good withdrawal deal, which has now unfortunately been rejected by the British Parliament, was arrived at, is because it was in the interest of all member states to arrive at that common position. Now, having put that marker down, I want to say to you, in relation to the way the Commission thinks on taxation, gives me a real problem. We are not a federal state. We are a collection of states which work together. It is the long-standing principle of that, that in the area of subsidiarity, that that and tax, particularly in the tax area, is crucial. And what I would just like to point out, where my thinking comes from on this, I appreciate you talk about, and you repeatedly talked in contributions about a race to the bottom by, you know, inducements or whatever. There is also a feeling among smaller member states mm -hmm. that there is a grab, a power grab by the top. So the economic policies that are of most beneficial use to the larger member states are being progressed by the Commission because there is a, a, a benefit to that in the ability to reduce subsidiarity. And the point I would make to you is this, and it ties in particularly with where we're going in the future direction of Europe, is it is that type of thinking that actually turns off European citizenry. It is the type of feeling that there is a centralization where one or two larger member states make pronouncements of their view and that then becomes very quickly mirrored in what the Commission states as its view. And that particularly, you know, there are, I'm thinking of one or two particular leaders uh, of large European countries which have quite a bit of difficulty running their own country and every time they encounter it seem to think it appropriate to pronounce on how they'd like to run the continent of Europe as if they were president of it. But when you hear that mirrored then by the Commission, I think that's the type of thing that you, as the Commission, need to guard against, and in the area of taxation particularly, because it is a sovereign right of a member state to control that area. And all we're looking for as a country when we're talking about this is the respecting of that right. And that's why I was very glad to see, by the way, that the digital tax uh, went to the way of the dodo uh, the other imagine. day, which I think was a, 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 a lesson in what happens if you try and bully smaller member states sometimes with proposals. Sorry, I'll let you come back on that. Uh, as I said, well, uh, I take good note of, of, your, of your concerns. Uh, I mean, I, th I think it's difficult to discuss on perceptions, eh, because, because I know that um, small member states sometimes have the perception that the, the Commission only looks at big member states, 
while at the same time I can tell you the number of big member states that complain because, because of the fact that the Commission is looking at the, at, I don't know where, because if we don't look at the small member states and we don't look at the big member states, I don't know where we look. But I suppose that the Commission looks at what the Commission has to look at, is the treaties. So, and, and, and to, to, to guarantee that the treaties are implemented. So, uh, on this, I must say that you only need to, to look at the, uh, the, what, what uh, all the discussion and all the debate concerning industrial policy and uh, uh, policies related to industrial policy, where the Commission is considered uh, to be, let's say, against uh, the interest of uh, certain, certain uh, let's say, European champions. So, so I think that the Commission is precisely trying to not to get out from the treaties and try to apply the treaties that at the end of the day is what you sign, you're the, you're the member states. So, so this is what you sign. It's not, it's not the Commission that did. Um, we are aware that the European Union is not a federal state. But we are also aware that taxation is becoming, and in particular taxation of companies, is becoming a capital issue. And this is also related to a number of changes that are taking place at the global level in technology that at the end of the day what we see is that there are certain companies, there are certain companies, and this is the, that was the idea behind the taxation on the digital companies, that are clearly escaping to the, to the let's say, to the obligation to contribute to the common good while at the same time they are using the common good. So I think that this is, this is important to, to keep in mind. We are not a federal state, but we were not a federal state when we, de when we decided to harmonize the VAT. We were not a federal state. And however, we decided at a given moment, you decided, the member states decided, at a given moment that it was, there was a need of a, let's say, harmonized tax, tax on indirect tax, and, and harmonize indirect tax, indirect tax in order to underpin the functioning of the, of the single market. And today what we see, when we see the, let's say, mobility of certain tax bases, the fact that certain companies are able to shift the tax base from one country to the other, I think that a certain degree of harmonization is needed. And of course, as I said, Personally, I think that these companies which are using a single market, high level market, rent market, in order to, let's say, get profits and do not contribute with these profits, I think taking into account all the needs that we have, social needs that we have in our countries, I think that it was worth thinking of the possibility of harmonizing certain tax bases and harmonizing certain taxes. In any case, I mean, it's true that the ECOFIN rejected the proposal, but it is true at the same time that we have a very good technical document, which has been acknowledged by everybody that technically is, is, uh, is good, in order to allow, let's say, the member states who want to, to implement, to implement, uh, but I said, as I said, uh, the needs are there and we need to finance these needs eh, in order to avoid precisely that inequality goes out of control and so on and so forth. So, so uh, of course, I have to respect and I have to, to let's say, to, to, to accept the result of the ECOFIN the other day. But at the same time, we need to think of the, all these issues together, collectively, because, because these companies, which have not a flag, they are using the certain, let's say, uh, tax circumscriptions in order to avoid paying taxes and contributing to the common good. Thank you very much. I, 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 we could discuss this for a very long yeah, time. I know, we could I know. do a, a whole session on this on its on its own. Uh, but I am conscious of time, and uh, I particularly just want to, Deputy Director General, acknowledge the time you've given to our committee today to answer all the questions, the, your colleagues as well, for coming into us. This ongoing, almost now annual engagement with our committee is always incredibly welcome. It's very informative for us 
uh, as a committee. I hope that you take out of it as well um, quite a bit in terms of hearing our members' views. So with that, I am going to conclude our meeting here today. There being no further business, our, our meeting will now stand adjourned until Wednesday, the 27th of March at 2 p.m. My thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.